morning and welcome to News 24's Frontline. I'm Catherine Rice. I'm one of the team members of the multimedia team at News 24. And today we'll be tackling some really important questions that parents around the country have been grappling with. Is it safe for your children to return to school? What are the risks really? I mean, we've already seen a stop-start opening with schools supposedly depending on the 1st of June, then that being postponed by a week. Are we gonna see that happening going forward if a child gets sick or a teacher contracts COVID? We're joined today by some experts who I think will have a lot of the answers that parents have been looking for. On the, on the panel, we have our Chair of Pediatric Red Cross Children's Hospital, Professor Heather Zarr. We also have pediatrician and allergist, Professor Eugene Weinberg. We also have the principal of Red Hill in Johannesburg, Joseph Jurassi, as well as the lecturer in the education department at the Nelson Mandela University, Nadima Mostan, and psychologist, Khair de Creel. I think um, for most parents, the health risks are top of their concerns. So I'd like to start with the doctors. Um, Professor Weinberg, Children with underlying conditions, are they a particularly high risk category? I have a daughter with type one diabetes and I've opted to send her back to school. Um, do you think this is a wise decision? A lot of parents with children with asthma are really concerned. We're going into the winter months now. What is your opinion? I, I can't tell you how often I've had that question lately, you know, from concerned parents from all over the country when they heard that schools were opening on first on June the 1st and then on the 8th. Um, the, uh, originally the province had said that certain underlying so-called comorbidities, I don't particularly like that word, but that means other illnesses, associated illnesses. Uh, the children were, uh, they, they could, if they had, if uh, on medical advice, they could uh, be homeschooled or not attend school. Um, but that, that advice uh, subsequently, the various societies in this country, pediatric societies, the, the South African Pediatric Association, the endocrine, South African Endocrine Group and the Allergy Society of South Africa have all put their weight behind sending children back to school uh, in, the major, in the vast majority of cases, except for few uh, exceptions. Um, it, with asthma, for example, even the most severe can go to school provided their asthma is well controlled and that they're using the medication regularly. Uh, with diabetes, the same applies. Provided the child is well controlled, the child can go to school, safely go to school. With, you know, with the, all, all, with all the uh, safety measures in place at school, obviously, uh, that is in the background every time. Professor Weinberg, if children do contract COVID-19, what are the chances of them having sort of long-term impact on their health? Well, the, 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 ch the chance of a child under, say, under 19 years of age contracting this disease, judging from reports from countries that have been quite severely affected, such as Italy, for example, and even the United States, show that very, very small numbers of children are under, in that age group are actually contract this disease. They seem to have a resistance to it. And, uh, and even when, if they do contract it, the very, very few of them have had actually had a very severe form of the illness. About one, between 1% 1 of those children who actually contracted it. So a very, very tiny number actually seem to get the very severe form of the disease. And, you know, worst case scenario for parents, a child dying from this. I mean, that, again, is also very unusual. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, but, but, you know, there's always, uh, the people say when you quote statistics, they always say, well, what if I'm that statistic? And so uh, that, is, that is the thing that concerns parents. And no matter how often you tell them that it that it's, appears to be safe, its chances are very, very low, they still worry. You know, and you can understand that because a child is very, very precious to them and they will, and they, it will take a lot of convincing. Professor Zah, if I can just uh, ask you, I think parents are also concerned if their child does show flu-like symptoms, what should they actually do? I mean, in the Western Cape, 
we're seeing such a spike in infections and we've actually been told by the authorities that if you're under the age of 55 and if you don't have comorbidities then you can't even get a test so what should parents do should should parents be going out and getting their children the flu vaccine for the ordinary flu what what do you recommend Morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, I, firstly, I just want to um, add to what Professor Weinberg said. Children do not develop severe disease. In the whole of Wuhan, there was three children admitted to ICU and one who died. There has not been a single death of a child in Italy or in South Korea. In the USA, I think there were um, three deaths. So remarkably in this epidemic, children are spared. And we believe this is because children develop um, immunity that manages to contain this virus. At the risk of getting severe disease or of dying is really very, very, very low in this disease. And in fact, your risk of dying from influenza, from flu as a child, is much higher than from COVID. Uh, we're now in the respiratory season. We have two viruses that are circulating, respiratory syncytial virus and influenza virus. There are many more cases of respiratory syncytial virus or influenza virus than COVID in children currently, and many more admissions to hospital from these illnesses, even though the number of admissions have decreased because we've been wearing masks and staying at home and so on. I definitely um, um, support that all children should get the influenza vaccine. It's a way of protecting against influenza and it's also a way of... Let's go back to you, Professor Zarr. Um, you were talking about children and their exposure to grandparents. I think that's been particularly hard during the COVID-19 pandemic for grandparents to be kept away from their grandchildren. How risky for them to actually hug their grandchild? So I think we're learning a lot through the epidemic. We don't have all the answers yet. Uh, I think it's wise to have caution in terms of interaction of grandchildren and grandparents. We know that age is the key susceptibility to developing severe disease. Um, and you know the risk of getting severe disease or of dying is, is exponentially increases if you're over 70 and then over 80. Um, although, um, you know, children are less likely to transmit the infection, hugging is very close. Um, and in households, for example, in the household studies done in Wuhan, the risk of transmission to someone in the household, and, and obviously bear in mind that those households have one child. So if there's an, one person infected in the household, there's about a 6% chance of transmitting to another person in the household. I... Um, would advise um, caution and, and distance for grandparents and grandchildren. In fact, I'd advise elderly people to stay in lockdown. You don't want to be exposed to COVID. You should have social distancing, hand hygiene, wear a mask. And I know it's hard emotionally and physically to be apart from grandchildren, but I think this is the wisest decision for now because there is there's, although it's low, there is a risk that children can transmit, and particularly close contact is 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 um, is at risk for for transmission. So, I think it's short term pain. Stay away from your grandchildren. Keep safe as an elderly person or someone with an underlying illness, um, and then hopefully there will be still many years to enjoy with your with your grandchildren. Professor Zarr, we've heard about the high risk factors of diabetes, hypertension, obesity. Are these things very prevalent in South African young children? And when our um, experts talk about diabetes, are they talking about type 1 or type 2? Okay, so the amazing thing in this epidemic is that, as I said, children are largely asymptomatic. When they get infected, they don't even develop symptoms, or if they develop symptoms, they're very mild. The other extraordinary thing is that children with underlying conditions, underlying chronic lung disease, diabetes, and so on, also don't seem to develop severe disease. It's an extraordinary thing. We don't have another respiratory virus that behaves like this because you know, we normally think of these children as particularly vulnerable. Um, but this is not occurring. This is not the pattern that we're seeing across the world. It's true that the few children who've died or the few children who've been admitted to ICU have got underlying illnesses, but they've had, for example, the one child in Wuhan who died had um, intersusception, a, a, bowel, uh, a, a bowel torsion, actually a surgical condition of their bowel. Um, so 
we're not seeing, for example, large children with asthma or large children with cystic fibrosis or large children with diabetes coming into hospital with severe disease or um, really having a, a, a severe course. Um, so, you know, this, this notion of children being more susceptible if they have underlying disease is very different to that of adults. We clearly hypertension, diabetes um, are emerging as, as, as key um, risk factors. And I, again, I just support what Professor Weinberg said, that if you have a chronic illness in your child like diabetes or like asthma, and it's well controlled, your child is, can go to school and is probably, um, you know, at lower risk of, of uh, well, at, at, at has a low risk of, of getting COVID. You know, the other question is about other exposures. So, so, so people are going to work, parents are going to work, parents are going to the shops. There's exposure to COVID in all these settings. And it's much more likely that a child, in fact, is going to get COVID from being brought in from one of those environments than at school. Uh, well, in fact, at school, the key people to to be, to make sure are not sick would be staff. You you know you would want to exclude any sick member of staff and any sick child from the school place because sick people are potentially um, able to transmit, and adults, particularly, um, as I said, and particularly if they're sick, um, may transmit. Absolutely, and I think. Um that's why schools and their preparedness is so important. And the minister has said that 95% of our schools were ready. Um, and Nadima and, jo and Joseph would be able to answer for us. But Nadima, to start with you, what do you think about readiness across the school? You know, are, I mean, of course, we're not going to necessarily see the consistency that we'd like to see. Some schools don't have the right infrastructure or water. What are your concerns about schools and whether they're actually ready to receive students? Um, thanks very much for having me. Um, I think, I think what you know, I take a systemic view of this, um, and as a parent of an asthmatic child, I'm really um, heartened to hear what the, the medical professionals have to say, and it, it does relieve some of my own anxiety. But when I step back and I take a look at the the system of education we have. It exists in the most unequal society in the world. And our education system mirrors this inequality. We have schools that you won't even recognize as school. And then we have schools that have huge tracts of land and every available and, and you know, can afford to pay for additional teachers. Um, and, and against the backdrop of this inequality, um, we're talking about preparedness. Um, equal education, for example, um, in my province, the Eastern Cape, has been fighting an infrastructure battle since 2013. Um, the government's, our, our infrastructure budget, budget by over 8 million rand in 2018, um, the idea that schools must be physically ready to, to deal with COVID. Um, we weren't physically ready to deal with teaching and learning before COVID. Um, in a lot of our schools, it's just... We didn't have the proper space. Um, we don't have the teacher component to deal with, um, you know, the demands of teaching and learning, let alone um, the issues of multi-grade classrooms and overcrowdedness, et cetera. Um, schools don't have toilets. Schools don't have water. And even though we're told that this is coming, you know, we're trying to get water tanks in, which the water tanks that are delivered aren't filled. Um, and there's no sort of plan around that. There's no plan around what do we do when our teachers get ill and um, we, when we have gaps in our teaching cohort um, because it's, it's all very well to talk about children and it's very important to know as a parent about whether your child can get ill. But a schooling system relies not simply on children. It actually lives and dies on the backs of its teachers. So um, I, I think that a focus on teachers is very necessary. Um, we have we have aging teaching cohort, and it's we're already under a shortage of teachers. Um, so I, I'm seriously concerned about the opening of school um, against the backdrop of an already unequal, unjust system. Um, because some children will be fine, and some schools will be fine, but the vast majority of our schooling system isn't fine. And um, this COVID pandemic has added an additional stressor onto an already stressed system. Um, and we don't seem to have adequate responses to it that allow not just for going back, 
but for going back in a just manner, in a, in a fair and equal just manner. We have a moment here to, to rethink how we can arrange education in this country and we don't seem to be taking it. We seem to just be pushing, let's get the curriculum done, let's finish the year and um, wanting to brush aside long-standing inequality in our system. Nadima, I think, you know, uh, one of the major concerns that parents face is that they are now having to go back to work. Um, at least their children, uh, you know, the, particularly the young ones, are looked after at school. They're perhaps getting access to a, a good meal during the day. Uh, they looked after. So it's quite difficult because, you know, do those benefits uh, uh, the, the, the disparities and, and what the government is facing, trying to get everybody on the on the same footing. Um, what what do you think about that and the, the, the fact that parents do now need to go back to work? Right. So the, so so you're not wrong. The decision to open schools is not an educational loan, and I think um, you know it's driven strongly by an economic imperative to get the economy going again and. And of course, I understand that. And I also understand that a lot of parents simply don't have a choice. Um, schools are now saying uh, they will not offer online provisioning um, if, you know, the child must come to school or you must homeschool. And for a lot of parents, it's simply not an option. Um, having said that, you know, I, 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 I try very hard not to think in either ors. So it's not either school is open or closed. It's a school, can a school be open for quality, adequate teaching and learning for the children that are now coming to school um, and, and or, um, but also can a school be open for other reasons? So we talk about social learning. Um, I'm a member of the C19 People's Coalition, the ECD and the education subgroup. And, you know, we've been thinking around, why can we not think of schools as hubs for the social needs of a community. So for feeding schemes to remain open, we can control inflows into and out of the school. Um, schools as sort of sites where testing and tracing and contact tracing can take place. Schools as sites where other government social um, uh, programs can be housed as SASA distribution grants. So we don't have lines and lines of people standing outside of post offices, et cetera. You know, we can turn schools into community centers as well. And we can use it as a distribution center for teaching and learning materials. Um, this doesn't, however, take away the need for, um, you know, for children to be supervised, especially young children um, when parents have to go back to work. But we have to start imagining something beyond what we know because this pandemic has, has forced us into almost impossible positions and having to think beyond what we are comfortable with and what we know and, and we can't go back to a sense of normalcy and what was before, because what was before um, wasn't working for a lot of our children. And now with the added pandemic, it's, it's certainly not gonna work for those same children and then a whole lot more. So I have no answers to this. I just, I have an appeal for us to start um, thinking systemically. It's hard when you have your own children and you're having to deal with those kind of decisions. But, but you know, we have, to, we have to think of a system of education um, and then we also have to think about equalising that system because um, it, it's just not fair That's, that, for example, my child um, considered home, he has asthma, he, he, we've kept him at home um, and, you know, he gets to have online learning since April, whereas other children have not seen or heard a teacher um, since April. That, that, that shouldn't be happening. Absolutely, and and I think it's time for for us to think creatively. Whether that's teaching children through the radio systems or through the television, you know, one has to come up with creative solutions. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph, you are in a different situation. You 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 are the headmaster of Red Hill, where you do have the resources. What, what are some of the protocols you've put in place to make sure that your kids at your school are safe and that teachers are safe as well? You know, Catherine, it, it, it's so difficult to, to talk on a program like this because I'm sitting and I'm listening to Nadima um, and there's a huge sense of guilt because, believe you me, uh, private schools can go back. They, they actually went back two and a half months ago. 
Um, there's no doubt about that. But let's be honest that um, by, by private schools going back now is not is not making the gap bigger. The gap was always large. Um, as soon as schools closed down, private school kids carried on with their education. They carried on at home. Um, you know, I think that the issues Nadim is talking here about here are, are huge issues that have to be dealt with, you know. Um, and, and I think what this has done is it's absolutely brought to light um, the issues we have about with education in this country. Because private school kids, um, you know, they, they have a world-class education. They're living in a first world. And the rest of our kids are living in, a, in, in really in, in a difficult time. Um, and although I don't think keeping private schools from going back to school would make any difference, I think it's highlighted just where our country is in terms of education. And it's a very, very sad situation. Um, but that's not your question to me, but I did feel I need to put it out there that um, we, we absolutely, as private schools, understand the difficulties that schools are going through, not, not government. You know, I, I think a lot more should have been done up until this stage. So I'm definitely not defending government. I'm empathizing with the teachers and the principals and the children that are having to go back to, um, to, to government schools. Do I think kids need to get back to school? I absolutely think kids need to get back to school um, because I think it, it goes beyond um, just, uh, just teaching and learning. I think it goes very much to the, to the discussion of mental, social, um, and emotional well-being. Um, and like as educators, um, we have listened to the medical professionals. And that's the reason we were, we were happy to go back because our medical professionals told us the chances of your kids getting really ill um, are very slim. And so we had to take calculated risks. We've also listened to the psychologists who've told us that if you don't get kids back, you're going to be, parents are going to be dealing with issues that are the unintentional consequences of keeping children in an unhealthy, unnatural lockdown for, for, for a long time. And we've seen the reaction specifically of our younger students who've come back and you just see smiles on their faces and they are really excited to be back at school. Um, and it's amazing to watch the difference. Uh, these little kids can't really be educated on online learning. It, it, it really doesn't work. You can give them bits and pieces, but they learn from social interaction, right? That's how we learn. We learn by interacting with one another and young people learn from each other. It's, it's amazing to watch a child talking to another child and the reaction of the other child as they are learning from what the other child is actually doing. Um, and just the, the smiles on their faces. Older kids are okay. In fact, some of our older kids are preferring the online learning. Uh, it works for them really well. So we've gone into a blended kind of learning. But from the protocols we've put into place for private schools, uh, you know, I, I don't think any parent should worry about any good private school having the correct protocols. We had to be signed off by the government. So we had to go through it. It was amazing how government was so worried about private schools and about us signing off documents and protocols. Um, and that was my article that I wrote by saying, don't worry about the private schools. Don't worry about their protocols, right? Go and worry about the schools that really need your attention. Um, but our protocols are all in place right from a screening uh, screening of, 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 of teachers, screening of parents, screening, uh, in fact, parents are not allowed on our campuses, screening of students. They all had to fill out medical documentation um, and they were not allowed on until they had had clearance from doctors if they had comorbidities. So we went through all of those issues, all of the, clean, uh, the cleaning, sanitization has been put into place, the social distancing. We're lucky enough that, you know, we can, we can have only 14 kids in a classroom. We've rotated days. We've rotated morning and afternoon sessions. Um, and a whole lot of our parents are actually, it's, it's interesting, they, they're not scared of the virus. It's, it's been interesting having those discussions. They're saying our, our children must get the virus. There are so many viruses out there that this is just another one. And if we protect our kids in an unnatural situation, eventually they've got to go out there and they're going to get this virus. So let them come to school um, and let them just, you know, let's rather work on their emotional and their social well-being and their education, which in these early years, and that's why as a school, we brought back kids right from the younger ages. We brought everybody back at the same time. Um, because, you know, there, there are countries, um, other countries, where they're actually bringing in the younger children because, you know, children who are in, in, in matric, particularly in, I mean, in South Africa, you have children who are 18, 19, 20. It makes more sense to have the foundation phase kids 
who are learning how to read and write. So, so was that the reason behind your thinking of bringing those younger children? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's so important. These 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 early years are the years of childhood de- of of development, right? Of both cognitively and emotionally. And you miss out. And you know, if this was a three week stint, we could say, okay, that's fine. But this could be going on for the next, you know, for the next eighteen months, two years. Um, and you cannot, you you, def, you know, a grade ten and eleven a student, even a grade twelve student, learning online, they're getting everything they need. My students can go and write exams, no problem. But I cannot make up for the time wasted, okay, by young children not being in a schooling situation. And because we had the backing of medical professionals and from the psychological um, um, sphere, we were very confident to bring all of our kids back, making sure, though, that we had all of our safety and health protocols in place. I think, Khaire, if I could just bring you in here, I think, you know, as Joseph said, so many children um, have felt the psychological impact of being isolated. But there must be some children, I mean, a, a friend of mine's daughter is eight, she went back to school, her teacher wasn't there because, you know, she's got a husband with comorbidities, she had an all fall down because this new normal is quite hard for them to adjust to. And so my question to you is, how do you prepare children for going back to the new normal? And and what should we be looking out for as parents to assist them? Thank you so much. So, um, Catherine, you know, I want to say that we need to understand that um, children under the age of 12 and 13, so really your pre-adolescent younger children, they take their emotional cues from the parents. So as long as parents are going to be anxious and as long as parents are going to be hammering on the fact and throwing around this mantra that um, school's opening, it's a death trap for our children and so forth, kids hear that stuff. And that really, you know, they incorporate the anxiety of their parents. So first of all, for parents, they really need to check themselves. They need to check what they are saying, what they are talking about, and how they are um, communicating about COVID to their children. Um, Is it helpful to have the TV and the radio on in your house all day where the news is doom and gloom? Um, your, Your kids are listening to that. They're hearing that. So it's really important, firstly, to start filtering and really responsibly filtering what you are telling your child about this virus and how you're communicating to them. Um, The new normal is going to be, I I don't even like the word new normal because it implies that there is something called normal in the first place. And I don't think that's true. Um, Even just listening to everybody today, we've understood that there are different contexts in our country that each have their own sense of normality. And if we can really just start um, focusing on individualized responses for how to prepare children, I think that's important. There's no one size fits all approach to preparing your child because some children will be going back to private schools and there will be resources and the same teachers and the friends will be there. And some will be going back to government schools where it's going to be looking way different. Um, I think that one of the most important things that parents should be doing is engaging in communication with their children, but that the parents facilitate the message that gets to the kids. Your younger children, they respond beautifully to storytelling or to role playing. So parents can initiate that kind of activity with their child, you know, telling them a little story about a character that's going back to school for the first time and the kind of thing that the child might be experiencing. You know, seeing a teacher that you can't see her face, you can only see her eyes. Um, And practicing that at home, you know, most kids, uh, concerned parents have kept their children at home. So the kids don't even always know. I mean, they do by now because mom and dad wear masks, hopefully. But they're not accustomed to seeing people with masks. You know, um, I have I have two children of my own, and we have started to integrate them more into the community in the past couple of weeks. We take them to the park when the parks opened up. We've been moving around with them, and it's interesting. My daughter's five, and she she gets very frightened when people with masks speak to her. So you know, we've had to start thinking creatively about that. How do we at home, you know, introduce the concept of mask wearing? Um, how do we explain that to our children? Can we play a game? Can we put a mask on the teddy bear? So for your young children, game playing, storytelling, that's really important. And I would go with that strategy until more or less the age of seven or eight, depending on the maturity of the child. Um, then the second the second age group, when you're looking at that kind of um, eight to 10 group, 
communicating, telling them, explaining to them, being practical about it. They have got a lot of cognition. They've got a lot of understanding. And we, we can't think that these children are not affected. They know. They understand. They understand by now what death is. And they've heard you speak about these things. So I'm explaining to them that, you know, actually we've been in this lockdown. We, we knew something at the beginning. We understood certain things from what we thought because we looked at other illnesses. But in these past two or three months, we have learned so much new information. And this new information is telling us it is actually safe for you to go back to school. Um, but you have to start at home. In introducing your child to social distancing practices, you have to start at home introducing your, um, your child to um, hygiene practices, um, sanitizing, hand washing, that kind of thing, which hopefully most people have started doing. If you haven't by now, I really want to encourage you to start doing that. Um, a difficult age group, yeah. Um, I, I just wondered, you know, the, the older children, they yes. might be having a huge sense of loss, particularly matrix who mm. are missing calls and that kind of thing, which I, I'd like to come back to Joseph just now. But, I mean, how, how do you, what sort of signs should parents look out for for children who are actually hitting a serious clinical case of depression? Mm. Um, you know, it might yeah. manifest in cutting, it might manifest in other ways. What should parents be looking out for? Because children who are really anxious might be feeling even more anxious now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, what, what is very concerning is with the adolescent population that I work with, um, I am seeing a definite increase in serious mental health concerns. I'm seeing an increase in depression, isolation. Um, obviously, you know, if a child has a pre-existing mental health problem um, or mental health illness, then they are at a much higher risk of actually being severely impacted. Um, I, I've definitely seen an increase in that. And parents won't always know. Now, what has happened, one of the, the challenges is that social media is not conducive for mental health of adolescents. It's not conducive. But now what parents have um, started doing is allowing extra screen time, allowing extra time on social media because they're saying, but this is how my child is connecting with their friends. But social media is a massive disconnect. So if parents are wanting their children to be connecting, it needs to be on active platforms where there's communication, where there's conversation. So encouraging your kids to do a video call with their friends, that's, that's healthy. But encouraging or allowing your child to much time on on social media like Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, that's not so healthy. Okay, so that's one of the things that parents need to check out for: how is their child consuming social media? Because that is a very good indicator usually of of mental health. Is the child's sleep pattern still the same as it usually is? Are they have they turned around their day and their night? Um, do they get up at regular time? Is there a fixed kind of routine that the child can follow? How motivated is the child if they are being homeschooled, if they are um, engaging with academics at home? How motivated is the child to continue with that? Um, and then, you know, you were talking about the sense of loss that a lot of your older kids are feeling. I think we really need to acknowledge the loss and we need to be giving them the opportunity to grieve that loss. You know, um, kids that have looked forward to matric farewells um, or have looked forward to grade seven, you know, excursions or camps or becoming a head boy or a head girl. Um, all of these opportunities that they have once in their life have been ripped away from them. Not going to happen. And, you know, when you're a teenager, you are a bit selfish and you should be selfish because you are learning about yourself. So there is a lot of introspection. There's a lot of rumination thinking. And I think it's a real opportunity for us to teach our children about open and appropriate grief and helping our children with that, having, you know, giving them sometimes the opportunity to ask, you know, how do you feel about the matric farewell being cancelled? Um, and not wanting to just jump in and come to our kids' rescue. Um, I think that's something inherent in all parents. Your child's going through a tough time. What do you want to do? You know, I don't want my child to cry about the matric farewell, so what am I going to do? I'm going to have a little matric farewell at home. First, allow your child to just deal with the loss. And, and that creates a much more healthy and integrated sense of psychological well-being than just replacing it with something else. And then asking your child, you know, what, what would an, another thing be? How else can we celebrate this milestone of finishing school this year? Um, yeah, I think it has been a massive sense of loss. And I think, you know, we, we 
know about the disparities in the different communities. And I realized early on in lockdown, I remember I had one evening and I was so touched. And I said to my husband, there's something so heartbreaking about this because parents losing jobs, parents struggling economically means that next year, certain kids are not going to be able to go back to the same schools that they've been attending. I think that kids that are used to going to private school are going to have to be going to a government schools because they're not, parents can't afford it anymore. Um, kids that would have had opportunities to go to university, maybe on sports bursaries or whatever, these kids are losing the opportunities that really, I think, in the long run, is going to be creating a lot more inequality in our country. Um, so there is there's a definite impact on our kids' futures here. And we have to acknowledge that we have to discuss it with them. But also parents, you know, you know your child better than anybody else. Try and engage in conversation. I cannot actually stress how important open communication with your child is at any age, but specifically in the adolescent years. Joseph, yeah, if I could bring you back in here. I, um, I think, uh, of course, your school, being a private school, it probably is that access to counselling and that kind of thing. Um, is this something that you um, are, are looking at actively addressing when you when you are uh, bringing children back into the school classroom? I mean, there, there obviously would be more opportunity for them to discuss their feelings, as hopefully there would be across the board at all schools. Yeah, look, again, once, you know, we, we, we do have counselling services that are available to our students and our students, all that's happened is instead of seeing our counsellors face to face, even during the lockdown, um, you know, they were able to see their counsellors via Zoom so that they could Zoom into the counsellors and keep those um, those meetings going. But we have looked at a lot of things, again, being very lucky. We've done a lot of virtual stuff, um, you know. So we, for instance, next week we are having a virtual music festival. So the music festival didn't come to an end. Each house just worked on putting together all of you know, the, the musical acts and they put that together and we'll bring the whole community together to watch that. Um, Tuesday being Youth Day, we have a full program. We have our own internal radio station that, um, you know, that streams live all day. So all day we have got radio, the radio station going and we will deal with issues, you know, around commemorating Youth Day. But we've also opened up a a lot of discussions. I mean, one of the issues, and, and, and Gerda, you were talking about kids getting onto social media. Now, with the whole Black Lives Matter campaign, we can see that has gone a buzz. I mean, kids have now just taken to social media on these type of issues. What have we done on our Red Radio? We're having our own webinars all day where we're bringing back, um, you know, past students to talk about these kind of issues. So we're allowing the kids to continue doing what they're doing. We're having elections online for the SRC, for head boys or head girls. We're trying not to stop anything that these kids were used to. We're talking to them about postponing um, the metric dance. Even I've said to them, if it has to take place next year, their metric dance will take place. Um, you know, for those of them that are around, we will still have something for them to enjoy. And I think it's very important for them to look forward to something that even if it takes place next year, they will be able to reunite with their friends and, and relive what has been for the, definitely the matrix. Um, an incredibly difficult year. Again, though, I feel terribly guilty talking about private school kids missing out on things like metric dances, et cetera, when the reality of our situation is 80% and 90% of our population are missing out on the basics of education. And we also try and work with our kids understanding that. Um, so we get them to empathize with what's happening in the rest of the country. And that is really important for us. We're getting some questions coming through from our audience, and one of them is from Leanne Glamini. And this question, if I can direct it to you, um, Prof Weinberg, what, what is your response? A lot of parents are concerned about their children wearing masks for six hours a day. Is that a health concern? It, it's it's uh, not a health concern. Uh, obviously, we're talking about cloth masks. Those are the recommended masks. We have had a few problems uh, with the elastic uh, uh, irritating the skin behind the ear of the children, you know, when they wear them for long periods, uh, and also on the face, it's their faces itself, where the mask seems to irritate some of the children, especially if they wear them for long periods. Uh, also, I should mention that the mask must be washed regularly. You can't just uh, wear the same mask day after day. So you must have more than one mask so that you can wash the masks. 
and uh, and for the the irritation that occurs particularly behind the ears uh, you can put a little bit of vaseline on that in that uh, area it seems to help quite a lot uh, some people have also put a little bit of a, a, gau a gauze bandage a, a slightly a small piece of gauze behind the ears uh, to, to assist the child because it can be quite irritating actually uh, uh, just the one point that uh, that I also would like to mention about the schools is that we were assuming right from the start that the schools had the all of these safety measures in place, and we heard uh, quite clearly from Nadima that uh, majority of schools, especially in Eastern Cape, where she is, uh, that it's a, it's a, it seems to be a bit of a disaster there in that respect. Uh, one of the one of the uh, even the poorest some of the poorest schools in some of the areas seem to have uh, purchased a so-called disinfection tunnel, uh, which they subject the children to when they enter the school. I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's been a, a report about this in the medical journal this week. Uh, how that is a very very actually very dangerous. We don't know what chemicals they're using in these uh, disinfection tunnels. That we don't know whether it's a chlorine or you know what it is that they're using uh, as a disinfectant, but it's certainly very irritating for children with asthma, and we would I would strongly strongly discourage the use of these so-called disinfection tunnels. Apparently, they're very expensive as well. But even some of the poorer schools I've heard have purchased these tunnels. Professor Zhao, um, your thoughts? I, I mean, uh, of course, some children are also going to find sanitizers very um, irritating for kids who have eczema. How do you get around that? So I just want to um, add to what Professor Weinberg said. Masks are essential. They're the one, they're the, um, a very effective public health intervention. The World Health Organization just published a whole new analysis of all studies, and they are really highly effective to prevent transmission. So everyone needs to be wearing a, a, a mask in that situation, and everyone needs to have their own little um, brown paper packet where they put their mask when they take it off. Sanitizers um, are, are, are um, fine, but as you say, some ch kids and some staff don't tolerate it. Hand washing is just as good, if not better. So wash your hands with soap and water before you take off your mask, put it in a paper packet, wash your hands before you put it back on. That's highly effective um, for, for uh, preventing transmission. Um, for young kids, very young kids, wearing a mask is difficult, preschool children and so on. So visors have been developed. Uh, these are these, um, you may have seen pictures of them sort of um, uh, see-through um, visors. Visors are not as nearly as protective as masks. And actually, a visor should be worn with the mask. But for young kids where a mask is really difficult and uncomfortable to wear, a visor is second best. And I would, I would recommend that um, in, in those kind of situations. There are even um, see-through masks that have been produced for children who lip read, so children who um, um, are hard of hearing. And, and uh, really, people have had ingenious um, ways of, of developing these. And, you know, I hear um, my colleagues on this, on this um, uh, meeting saying the inequity in schools. The one thing that can be done by everyone is mask wearing. Social distancing, very difficult to do in some of the uh, living conditions that our children come from poor communities, hand washing may be even more difficult in certain situations, but mask wearing can be done. And I, 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 I really see COVID as an opportunity to try and diminish these inequities. It's an opportunity to strengthen the infrastructure of schools. And the most disadvantaged kids are being most disadvantaged by not going to school. We're hearing this across the board. So uh, there's an imperative here to get the most disadvantaged children back to school and obviously in a, in a safe way, but but we need to do this. Nadima, if, if you could just um, add your thoughts. I mean, it, it is such an unequal society. And when we're talking about masks, you know, will the government end up providing as the, the masks that are needed? I mean, the, the concerns in those communities must be quite high for parents who don't necessarily have access to just those basics. Um, yeah, I think, I think we shouldn't conflate schooling and education. I think these two things are very different. And I think that it's one thing to get people into a school. It's a quite another thing to educate. And we also can't relegate education to schooling. So I think that 
um, the kinds of creativity that needs to happen in order to level the playing field, so to speak, um, come in education provisioning. So it's about um, reimagining education in working class, poor and rural communities in ways that allow children to learn. Um, and that doesn't necessarily or doesn't not necessarily mean going back to school. Um, and especially a school that before COVID didn't serve you. Because remember, at the end of all of this, all these children are going to write the same exam and be judged on the same content, regardless of how they learnt that content or didn't learn it in a lot of cases. So, so we have a system that's set up to reproduce this inequality. Um, and if we're talking about real, if we're talking about change, seriously, then, then we have to not just look at the conditions that enable children to occupy a space, but rather what happens in that space. Um, and, and I said this before, I said, you know, it's, it's great to hear the health impacts or the minimized health impacts on children, because I think that's really important, uh, an important piece of the puzzle. But, but the system relies on teachers and, and children uh, can be in a classroom, but if you have a grade seven teacher teaching grade one children, we've got a problem. And then if we have a school, I, I live in Port Elizabeth, and I had a phone, frantic phone call from a, I'm a foundation phase um, preschool educator. So I teach teachers to become foundation phase teachers. And I had a call from an HOD in dispatch, desperate to find students who are who just left university um, because of the staff about them couldn't come back to school and so now we've got children able to come to school and we have empty classrooms in terms of teachers and so we we have to look at this holistically because um, you know tick our children can come back that's great um, who's going to teach them and what is the quality of that teaching and learning that's happening and I have the same question for online teaching because the assumption that we've you know, private schools have carried on. Um, I think we need to look at the quality of that online teaching um, because my child is learning and learning. Um, and I must admit that um, I fully agree uh, with the principle that, um, you know, the social interaction is key. And the younger the child is, the more key it is. So, um, yeah, it's a complex issue. Um, I agree, children, it's not. It's not an either or. I don't agree that schools should be open for the sake of opening schools. I think that we need to think about quality teaching and learning that will allow us to get some kind of balance in the system. And we need to think beyond schools to do that. We need to think in a community way. We need to use all the tools at our disposal, radio, TV. We need to think people don't have access to internet. Um, there's a very small percentage of our society that has full access to internet. So that's not even an option unless somebody's willing to rethink how we distribute um, connectivity. Um, and I do think that should be part of the, uh, the thinking. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And those are questions that, that don't have simple answers. Um, Joseph, if I can just come back to you. I, I, I think a lot of parents who are sending their children back to school now are feeling, what is the point? If I send my child back to school, and a teacher becomes it contracts the virus or child contracts the virus, they're just going to shut again. We've already seen that with a couple of private schools already. What is your protocol? What are you going to do at your school if a child tests positive or, or a teacher? Okay, so first thing, remember, we're all bound by waiting for what the minister decides. So if the minister decides at any time all schools will close, we will have to close. But let, let, let's take, for argument's sake, the minister doesn't do that. I am very strong on the fact that um, schools should not close because a few students get it, uh, get the virus or a few teachers get the virus. Um, lockdown was meant only for one thing in my mind, and that was to make sure that our hospitals uh, and our emergency services were up and ready for when this peaked. And we all know this is still going to peak, right? So there's no getting away. I've always said to parents, if you're asking me for a guarantee that your child you know, will be safe when they come to school, then keep your child at home, because I can't do that. We are waiting for the first students to get the virus and for the first teachers to get the virus. But we've tried to set up the school in such a way that each one of our schools on our campus are separated, classes are separated, 
And our way of going forward is eh, as soon as we, uh, look, we've been very lucky. We've been very, very strong on our parents um, getting back to us and letting us know what's happening with their children. In fact, if they, if they are not upfront with us and we find out, um, you know, we will suspend their contract because this is when community have to come together and they have to be upfront with the school. It's the only way we can ensure that the school continues to run. And if we think schools are important to run, then we have to keep them going. So our parents have been amazing in the first two weeks. As soon as there's any kind of a, a possibility that a student might have had a virus or come into contact with someone who's got the virus, they've let us know, they've kept the kids at home, they've tested for it. So we would have a look. If we saw an outbreak in a particular class, yes, we'd close the one class down and we would ask the students to then either be tested or to remain at home for 14 days. Um, but we don't intend closing. We intend monitoring each case by case as it happens and then having a discussion around which area of the school can we, should we close, which class should we close. But it would be senseless to have two kids who get the virus and now we close the whole school again. Uh, that would be defeating the purpose and we may as well all go back into a lockdown situation again. Uh, it is very important when we were talking about schools, at schools we're not only teaching education, and I think I agree uh, with Kerda that uh, we shouldn't be talking about the new normal. But the reality is schools are also set up to teach children how to deal with society. And what better... We seem to have lost Kerda. Seem to be having a problem with Joseph's audio at the moment. Um, Professor Weinberg, or can can we hear you at the stage? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, if we can just pause with Joseph at the moment as his technical issues get sorted out. Um, Professor Weinberg, we're getting a question coming through, which I think you'd be able to answer. And that is, you know, a lot of people are afraid that if somebody in the home has a comorbidity, that they go to school, get COVID, and then they come home and pass it on to their family member who has uh, hypertension or whatever it may be. Um, what, what do you think about that? Should they be very concerned? Well, it is an obvious concern. One can't say it's not, not a, you know, not a concern for that particular person. But when one looks at the actual, at the actual facts, it seems that very, children have a very, very low chance of transmitting this disease. This is an interesting research that has recently come to the fore. That in fact, and they, firstly, we I must re-emphasize that that they seem to have this type of this almost innate resistance to this to this illness. And secondly, they, they seem to have a very low chance of actually transmitting this condition in, in addition. So hopefully that is the situation, that it appears to be true. There are several studies to back this up now. Pro Professor Zah, if I could just come to you for a moment. Um, what would constitute an outbreak at a school? I mean, how many children would have to, or teachers would have to get it for, for the, that to be... Um, regarded as an outbreak, I mean, as a sort of potentially, um, you know, where the school would, would have to shut down? Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about that. Um, you know, an arbitrary number is three or more cases in a class, um, and as we heard, then the class would be cut down, uh, would be shut down, and it may not mean shutting down the whole school. On the other hand, you know, if, a, if it's much more widespread, then one would consider shutting down the school. But uh, I also must emphasize what has been said. We are going to get cases. Teachers are going to come. Staff members are going to be infected. We are going to see ca more cases in children. Although they're going to be mild, we're going to see them. The South Africa is on the upward of the epidemic. And we know that this virus is, is here. The problem is it's not here for a week or two weeks. It's here for many months still. And, um, you know, I, I don't think parents should get alarmed when they hear there's been a case or a few cases at school. You, you must expect this, the same as when you go to the shops. Shops periodically will be closed down or at work there will be um, co-workers, healthcare workers are getting infected. 20% of healthcare workers, 20% of positive tests are in healthcare workers. So we are going to see more infections. The question is how many of these infections are really going to be 
severe and get severe illness. And in children, fortunately, this is much, much, much less than from other respiratory infections. The risk is much, much, much lower. And balancing the risk-benefit ratio, we've heard about mental health issues. We've heard about feeding schemes. We've heard about education and learning. And we also know, for example, from adolescents that the peer group is really important in terms of learning from. Um, so I, I think, you know, given that we're in, in this for many months to come, and given that education is an imperative, mental health, physical health is an imperative, I, I can't see how keeping our schools closed with all the difficulties that there are in opening them is, is going to be the answer here. I think the answer for children and for child health broadly, and I'm talking about physical, mental health, is, is to open schools as far as we can. I mean, professors are, we are heading into winter. I think South Africa is unique in that we're heading into our, our, our rising tide of infections and we're heading into winter, which, you know, countries are going into summer and in Europe and it's, it's a different ball game. And I think that's also parents' concern is that they're heading, that they are sending their children off into these freezing cold conditions. Are they not putting them at, at serious risk by doing that? So again, it's a, it's a risk benefit um, question. And I, I would come back to a point that I tried to make earlier, which is in fact, that in the past, last year, when you sent your child to school in winter, the risk of them getting influenza and of getting quite severe illness from the influenza is much, much higher than the risk of getting COVID currently. Um, wearing masks is actually a very effective intervention, not only for preventing COVID transmission, but for preventing influenza transmission, for preventing RSV transmission. So inherent in sending your children to school is a risk of acquiring some sort of respiratory infection. If your child comes down with a respiratory infection, now it's much more likely to be RSV or influenza than, than COVID. You can protect against influenza by giving the vaccine, as, as we alluded to. But the risk of getting COVID is much, much, much lower than any of those other two viruses. And with a mask, actually, the risk of getting any of those three infections is much reduced. So, you know, parents have been sending their children to school for, for, for years with, the, with a known risk of them acquiring respiratory viral infections that are much, much more risky in terms of child's health um, than COVID. We unfortunately need to wrap up soon. So if we could just go back to Joseph, who, who froze there for a little um, moment. Um, you were talking about um, your school and, and the protocols you have in place there. I also just wanted to come back to you as well to ask you about um, indemnity forms, whether you are getting parents to sign indemnity forms and, and what you're indemnifying yourself against in those instances. Look, so we, we understand the law um, and we know that um, no indemnity form can protect you against negligence, right? So we didn't give specific forms for that. What we did do is um, every child had to fill in a disclaimer um, or had to fill in a medical form, as did every parent, uh, um, sorry, every teacher. And at the end of that, they had to say that they had promised that they were upfront, uh, that they had promised they'd given us all the information that was required so that the school could not be held liable if they had had a comorbidity, et cetera, that they had not let us know about. So even a whole lot of our teachers who said, yeah, well, we're over 60 or we've got asthma, but we're happy to take the chance. We couldn't let them do that because that could come back, uh, uh, come, come back at us. They had to go to a doctor. They had to get a certificate that said that they were healthy to come back to work. Um, but we didn't hand out willy-nilly a whole lot of just indemnity forms and, and felt that, well, if you just in, you know, indemnify the school, it'll be okay. We take our job really seriously and, uh, and, and we take the safety of our students very seriously. If, if I'm not mistaken, your school was, was one of the schools that looked at the tunnel of disinfecting children. Is that correct? And, and if, if that is the, the case, Joseph, what, uh, what prompted that and, and why, why have you decided not to go ahead with using that? So what we did is we obviously looked at every single um, way of securing our students. Um, and we had looked overseas. And at that time, they were, you know, overseas, they were using the tunnels. Um, we looked at the different chemicals and we actually ended up going for an, an organic chemical, right? Um, but like everything we do at our school, 
We then put a panel together of um, parents. And again, at private schools, we're very lucky. We have some of the best resources in the world. We put together a panel of doctors, uh, medical practitioners. Um, we invited the people that were selling the, 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 the chemicals, plus the people that sold um, the, sani uh, the, the actual tunnels, and we had a full-on webinar and discussion over this. And when we got to the end, although as a school, we thought we did not think that the organic chemical would hurt the students, there was no peer review articles that could prove to us that, th that this chemical had been tested and had been peer reviewed. And under those conditions, we would not put our kids under any kind of chemical. Should they come out, we said to them later, and they are peer reviewed um, experiments that have taken place and, and, and testing that has taken place, we'll relook at it. But at this stage, we didn't feel, we, we felt that well, there was more harm than any good that could be uh, taken from it. On that note, thank you so much for your time. Um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I think you've all given such interesting and, and well thought out answers. And I think parents who've been watching that will certainly be able to make their decisions far more easily. Um, knowing that the risks are actually, in fact, rather minimal. So thanks again for your time and goodbye. Thank you, Catherine. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.